Welcome once again to this edition of Personality Profile Show on Ghana Districts TV. Um, this is the only program that takes perspective look into the lives of some Ghanaian personalities who have made the mark in Ghana and elsewhere. My name is Emmanuel Frempon and my guest for today is one Nobel man who has achieved a lot. He was once the CEO of DVLA. He is a lawyer by profession. He is currently the Member of Parliament for the people of Bekwai and currently the first Deputy Speaker of Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest for today is Honorable Joseph Osewusu, popularly known as Joe Wise. Honorable, you are welcome to this edition. Thank you very much. Honorable, <coughs> I want to know the very meaning of your name, Joe Wise. Can you tell us? Well, <laughs> are you as wise? as Solomon in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you to judge, but you know, in 1976, okay. I started secondary school, those, what today's high schools were called then, at Drabing Asante. It was a fashion then, I was 40 years young. It was a fashion then that everybody has a nickname. Okay. I'm called Joe by everybody, but there was a senior, he was our sports prefect, he was, also, he was called Big Joe. Joe, so I adopted Big Joe, then one of my mates called Special George, he said, senior Big Joe will get you, if you call yourself Big, Big Joe, so he said, take Joe Wise, but I liked it, because you know, in a can, your born day name also has an, um, uh, how do I call Mrani in, in, so um, every born day name has a nickname, so to speak, attached to it, so um, Kwejo was born on a Monday, okay. so Kwejo's Mrani is Okutu Nyanseni, Kwejo Kutu Nyanseni. So it fit well into my Bond Day nickname. So I adopted it. Who is Joe Wise? My mother and my father called me Kwejo Obusu. Okay. Bond Day Born. Born to Bikel Say and Kwebama, both deceased. Okay. Born at Bekwai. Grew up at Bekwai. Um, my basic school, St. John's Primary School, Bekwai. Um, <clears throat> between 1967, just about five years, and I enrolled at the primary school. And then in 1976, after Form 3, I passed the common entrance then and went to driving secondary school. I loved it. That's where the nickname Joe Wise comes Joyce. from. <laughs> yes. So, so, how many siblings did you have? Eight from my father, but in all, no, by my mother, eight more. Uh, I'm the second born of my mother, but the seventh born of my father. Wow. So. That's a large family. Ooh, for an Asante man, that's not large enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there are 15 of us, 13 of us are now, no, no, 17 of us, 13 of us are now alive so currently I have 12 siblings wow. so viewers you are still talking to honorable joe wise who is the first deputy speaker of ghana's parliament talking about what i describe as a large family what are some of the challenges you encountered growing up as a child generally growing up today <laughs> i look at myself and i'll be um probably classified poor but I never understood what was called poor then because there was food at home every time every morning we were going to school you would eat before you go by they give you money to buy food at school and then so will you say your father was that rich today I look at him <laughs> as I knew him and I thought he was poor <laughs> but one okay. none of us was ever sent home for school even if he had 
nothing to eat, school fees you paid. Whatever it took, you uh, paid the school fees. So, so you, you would rather describe him as a responsible man? Lots. Very, 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 very responsible. Very, very. You will not have like or today what to call uh, luxury. Yeah. No, they had a private bay, a private car, Pijo 403. It broke down many years before I grew up. I was standing right by the roadside in, our, in front of our house for many years. But I, I recall when we used to travel in it, uh, Pijo 403. Then, yeah. They were running a timber firm, a company, the three of them. My father, his other brother, the chief, and their close friend, Papa uh, Kofi, Mr. T. They grew up, uh, they worked together for many years as I saw them until they each died. Um, should I say, because we were, today I call us street boys. We grew up on the streets. Because you come out of the house, you enter the streets. The choir was uh, largely, should I say, a semi-urban community. Very large numbers of the streets were tarred all the time. So you return from school, you take off your school uniform, put on shorts, no shirt. We get out, all the other boys come. We are playing football here, we are walking around here. Are going to harvest mangoes at the bungalows. Uh, the official residences of the MC, there are a lot of mangoes around. Mangoes, gravers, just go and harvest them. We are all working in groups all the time, different groups. But we're happy together all the time. There was really no occasion where. <laughs> so, because even if you're hungry in your home, you go to your brother's home, there's food. You eat. Your brother comes to your house, you eat together every time, everywhere. So, uh, one of my friends, Nanab and Pase, said, be any be a mamin kwem. Because it's the same, the same things we all eat together. And that's how we grew up together. When did you um, decide on what you want to become in future growing up? I think sometime in 1969. Between 69-70, before Buzia's government collapsed, I was in... Do you ever dream of becoming a top politician in Ghana? I don't know about politician, but I, that was when I told myself I would become an MP. Okay. My father used to send me to buy newspapers. Okay. Often by the time I walked to the, the sold at the post office, uh, by the time I returned, mm -hmm. I had read Today in Parliament, the column <laughs> Today in Parliament. I used to read everything I read about how the arguments the MPs made and wow. things. So I made up my mind I'll be an MP. Oh, okay. I didn't know how <laughs> because I remember the election. Then I saw them queuing and um, uh, queuing to vote and so on. After that, I don't know how the the results were declared, but. I, I told myself I'll be an MP. Then in 1979, Buzia's government was removed when I was in primary five. Yeah, 1972. That scared you of becoming a politician? Well, it, no, it didn't. Okay. I followed the champions, but I never really understood what they, they, they meant. I, I always tried to relate that to presidency, Nkrumah's presidency, but my orientation was against soldiers anyway. So, uh, even though I respected them, I admire the, the way they do things, order, but I never thought that soldiers should be in government. I mean, people I have not chosen okay. should lead me. So, right. So, then in 79, Liman's government came. I was actively involved, even though I couldn't vote. I was still a young man, 1979, I was 17. Yeah, so, but I actively involved. I was in secondary school from three. So I started reading and understanding the cause. And in between, I'd read a lot about Nkrumah's literature. From the time, primary four, primary three, practically everything about Nkrumah, those I've read every, every one of them. My father was an Nkrumahist. Okay. So 1979, he was actively involved in Liman's party, PNP. Very, very actively involved. But Akwai is basically uh, a UP. So 
My father's candidate was called Bice. Also, Bachi also. Bice. Yeah, we we're following him. Bice, Bice. <laughs> and he lost. He lost to the PFP candidate. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name now. It needed me. But then I was active in the youth group called the Kwai Ancestors Association. Practically, I created that, but when the leaders, the seniors came in, I was in Form 3, Form 4. Then when the university students came in, they made me the creator, uh, assistant PRO. <laughs> but I'm just happy to be in their company. I'm just happy to be following them around. And But we got involved in a lot of political discussion, inviting uh, the MP, uh, there was one minister from our constituency, but, uh, he was minister for defense. <laughs> we insist on meeting them, they come to the assembly to meet us and so on. So I got involved in a lot of political discussions. And so. But <clears throat> along the line, I found that what my orientation and Nkrumah's orientation were not agreeing. You know, so in them from 1980 there about my interest in uh, CPP and PMP was it was not gelling with my personality and how I understood. Now, I'm very independent-minded and a very liberal person, so I I enjoy my freedom. So I start reading about the things that in Kuma was uh, uh, alleged to have done. I can't prove any of them. And the, the more I read about those, the more I got angry <laughs> about even myself for supporting uh, the propaganda I'd read much uh, earlier. Share with us uh, the experience, okay. whether or not you took up some uh, leadership position that has helped your time now as the first deputy speaker of this parliament. All right. So I finished this form in 1983. Um, that was just before the universities were closed down. Okay. And my results came, I had gained admission to the University of Ghana. Uh, I'd done all the registration, everything. Then they said the universities will not be reopened. We were actually giving a date. Okay. And before the date came, it was uh, rescheduled, they say indefinitely. Oh, during all that period, I was working on my father's truck as a, How was it feeling? a driver's mate. So I recall the first time I heard the announcement that the reopening has been deferred indefinitely. I was sitting in the truck at Bekoya Broadway and I was so, so heartbroken. Because in my mind's eye, I was already at Komod Hall. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had been posted, assigned, assigned to Commonwealth Hall. Okay. Actually, in the forms I filled, they were supposed to select three halls. Okay. First choice, I chose Commonwealth Hall. Second choice, Commonwealth Hall. Third choice, Commonwealth Hall. <laughs> so I think. Is there any special reason for choosing? I, whilst I was uh, in this form, I was a member of uh, GUNZA, Ghana United Nations Students Association. Okay. We attended a conference in, Com uh, in Commonwealth Hall. Oh, I love the architecture and the design of the hall. You know, we attended conferences at the other hall, but none of them had the same uh, aesthetics as Commonwealth Hall. So, and then I met some of the students who were saying that this is the only hall where water runs. The other hall, sometimes they have to go and fetch water and carry them. So. Okay, my mind was made, Commonwealth Hall. <laughs> The so first choice, Commonwealth Hall, second choice, Commonwealth Hall, third choice, Commonwealth Hall. So I got admission to study law and classics. And that's my, uh, the course I was giving, law, classics, and archaeology. I went to Commonwealth Hall. I was very happy. Our songs, the choir, Vanda Choir, very active in it. I joined in everything we do. We do something we call protect. <laughs> we sing and go to the gate and come and back. Come back. Uh, I loved everything about Commonwealth Hall. Very active in everything we do. And I loved the way we did our politics. Every time we select, we elect leaders. Whereas other halls were electing their hall executive for one year, we were, we were electing us for one term. So for Michael term, we elect 
uh, Lent term, we liked, and then the Trinity term. Those are how the terms were called. Did you ever take up any leadership position there? Yes, but yeah. before I got to contest in the election, the constitution of the whole was changed. And we were made one year annually. Oh. So I contested and won as the first president to be elected for one year. <laughs> All the previous ones were elected for, for one, one term. Mm -hmm. And then the constitution had been changed and I got elected and I was for one year. So that was 85, 86 academic year. Okay. I was elected president of the junior common room. By that reason, I became a member of the residence board and the hall council and so on. So I started taking active part in decision making in the hall at various levels. So, and I enjoyed every bit of it. I learned from the seniors I, and the lecturers and the hall masters and the vice chancellor. We sit with them. And sometimes, because I probably was too reasonable for a student leader, I was quick to say, oh, I agree with this decision. They said, No, you can't agree. Because <laughs> uh, Ofori Obo was my, my SRC president. Uh, they said they proposed that we should increase some fees that we were paying. After listening to the presentation made by the hall masters, I thought it was reasonable. I mean, there's a cost to everything we enjoy. So I spoke, I gave the reason, they said, no, they tend to look at me and say, why, why, you can't agree why, why, government is paying, why should it be? <laughs> you know, so I had to withdraw my... <laughs> But then I learned something about student psyche, that the mentality that we should not take any cost as young students. I, I grew up with it, but I felt uncomfortable with it. So, so, so what, what's so different between um, student politics and uh, the system we are running now as a country? Uh, student politics was you're quite limited in okay. the demands on you. You didn't have to give anybody anything to ask for it. And after the election, nobody came to you financially for anything. But then when there are matters related to this, then you have to lead. Sometimes you disagree with your colleagues, but you are a leader. This is what in Common Hall, <laughs> I recall, was supposed to charge to um, Professor Senzochu was our hallmaster. Said he had gated a student because his girlfriend had come to visit him and stayed over. By the university rules, you are entitled to entertain visitors up to 12 midnight. Okay. And so, uh, this guy, Danso, his girlfriend had stayed over. And then when we had gone for lecture, the girl had come into the main <laughs> compound and was washing. Oh. We were guessing, the, instead of hiding, so the whole master was walking through the hall to his office when he saw her. He was appalled. So we asked question her, found out who we called, and then he put her through this procedure, and the punishment was, you're gated. What it means is that you stay in the hall for that period. But they made it such that you can even sneak to go and to lectures and come, because they had every two hours sign at the porter's lodge that uh, you were here. Then the thing leaked. Then, hey, the man doesn't want us to munch. <laughs> he, that was, then some of the lecturers whispered into our ears, but don't mind him. He, when he was a student here, his girlfriend was always coming. And, oh. <laughs> then it got us infuriated and things. And one morning when I woke up, had a meeting, said, We are going to South. What for? This is his office business. Oh, no, 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 no. People much. I didn't even know where his house is, but hey, I had to go because our hall president. We went to his house. He was not there. Carried his children shoulder high, walked around them, and then he left them and came back. Then the whole council calls me to justify our actions at the end. Wow. First thing is that personally, I didn't agree with that procedure. But I have to go and defend it. Because that is the, the, the yes. Some of the challenges of a leader. 
It's not everything that your supporters or your members do that you support. But you can't abandon your role because. So I tried to make an argument and say, my friend, you can't lead from behind. I said, there's this matter, the decision was taken by the SCVG. And in Commodore, we had a parallel um, hall arrangement. You're a hall president, you're elected. Then there's a SCVG, Supreme Council for Vandals and Guys. That is headed by the chief vandal. Okay. So all the things that the actions and the decision is taken at the SCVG. But the university does not recognize SCVG. So when it happens, then they call you to come and answer. So after the meeting, I come and call the meeting and say, listen, you take decisions and implement without involving me. Then I have to go and answer. They say, you're a leader. So yeah, I agree. But the point is that you take decisions, you take responsibility. After a long meeting, say, OK, the way it is, we have to go and try and resolve the matter. So I went to see Professor Kumadu. At that time, he was a, a hall tutor, not a senior tutor. So I called on a a JCR meeting for him. He came, he tried to persuade us how we didn't do well, we should apologize. After a long talk, 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 then they said, okay, you you have spoken, go, let us take a decision. <laughs> said, I understand, when you visit somebody and they serve you tea, it means it's time to go. <laughs> so he understands, they only leave. But then after long hours, I had to write. A uh, letter of apology to the whole master and to uh, the senior tutor that what we did was inappropriate and things. So I learned one of my sharp lessons about allowing people other than you and your team who have responsibility to take decisions for you to implement. But Commonwealth Hall was a different dynamics altogether. And I loved everything that in the hall. I still feel very much a part of the hall, except that sometimes today. What we call vandalism is not the kind of things we used to do. Violence was never, so, so never part of vandalism. So if you have to go back to the university, would you still choose Komoto as your home? I'll do the same thing. First choice Komoto, second choice Komoto, third choice Komoto. That's interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> let's, let's look at your time uh, in a bar, when you were called into the bar, and mm -hmm. when you even dreamed of becoming a lawyer. I think, I think it developed, as I said, I grew up at the palace. Yeah. Every Sunday there was arbitration. Okay. And when the others sit and they are hearing the arbitration, they'll say, witnesses, mm -hmm. take them, the young people in the house. You go and hide them. When they need them, you bring them in. But when you take that, they pay you. I said, uh, so witness fee. So I was always around Sunday so that, hey, I'll get money. <laughs> I'll take them to go and hide them behind the house. Uncle Father and Sephora Brown, go and bring the witnesses. There you go. Then you who brought you the witness. Remember how much we have been paid for? <laughs> don't remember. Don't, the, the figures have changed. Okay. Uh, currency has changed. So. Okay. But it was not much. But it was very useful. Sunday, Monday morning, you have money in your pocket apart from what you got from your parents. Sometimes they say, oh, but you, yesterday you got money. Well, right? use your money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I also learned something about how people perceive adjudicators. They, they will be observing, listening, they won't make any comment. But after that, the comment they make about each of the panel members, they tell me how much value they place on them. And I learned my lessons about the importance of your integrity. People may not complain in your face, but they form their own opinions about you and their respect for you take a dip if they think that you're, you're dishonest, you know. So I think that's where I built my interest in law. And then any time I was out of school, I just walked to stand by the court and watch proceedings. And I will, oh yes, yes, that required circuit court, required district court. I love the lawyers in their suits and ah, oh, I love. I started wearing suits at a very young age because I loved the, the way the lawyers appeared, you know. So by the time I got to the system, my mind was made, I want to be a lawyer. 
Yeah. I recall that um, one of our teachers asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, I want to be a lawyer. I said, oh, okay, you have to go to law faculty and you must get, not get anything less than I can get eight. Or otherwise, you won't get, you know. Those are the things that my orientation was towards. So I built also a value of being focused from there. That is where I'm going. My mind is there. My mind is focused on that one. All other things, I call them distraction. And I don't allow the distraction to influence my focus. So, in my sixth form period, you know. But do you really have, do you still have that political ambition? Yes, uh, uh, because at every point you're contesting elections mm -hmm. and winning some, losing some. It was all politics growing up into it. By that time, I had not decided. In fact, there was no politics to put at that time because PNDC are taking over uh, and so we're not sure what was going to happen so we're down then when in the later when they started bringing the district assembly concept and we told ourselves these are military things we won't take part so we refuse to take part so viewers you are still talking to honorable joe wise who is the first deputy speaker of Ghana's parliament. What is this case that you really took up that you can still look back and say, yes, I managed, I tried so hard to win this case. Do you, do you recall any? Well, there are many of them. Okay. Uh, do you recall the case involving the Owabi water area where Ghana water went and demolished people's houses claiming that, yes. Um, at that time, Dr. Nani was the MP for the area. So I was at the choir one Sunday when he drove there, the escape bar for said, Joe, this is a challenge you have. This has happened within our constituency. We want you to take up this case. So I drove back with them to uh, Kumasi, took the cases, took all the evidence, and then I set up the case against Ganota. And it took us quite some time, but. In the end, I got an injunction stopping an altar from continuing the demolition of the exercises. And so it was because it involved a lot of property and a lot of very prominent people. And then, the then, as I had apparently, according to them, had given them the free authorization to do that. Meanwhile, I was representing chiefs. You know, so it was a dicey case. Okay. But I had the MPs behind me. You know, it, did, it was a very brilliant case I did. But one of the cases I remember very closely, I did it as a pro bono, I think in my first year. Uh, Justice Williams. I was always following my seniors, but as usual, looking very sharp. So I, was, uh, I, was, I want you to do this case for this man. The case, the uh, Okay, the title is Republic versus Yaobuamao, so alias EBC. And EBC refers to say that her mother-in-law is a witch. Uh, her witch, your witchcraft, is big. It's like this. The <laughs> big and uh, they, they, they named it. They gave it his nickname. Oh, then. Something happened, he killed the old man. She was charged. And it was assigned to me by the court. You know that by, by law, anybody charged with an offense for which if you're convicted, you will be sentenced to death or to life imprisonment, you have to have a lawyer. So the court is allowed by law to assign lawyers and if the lawyer prepares a charge, the state will pay. But most of the time, because by our own code of conduct as lawyers, we are supposed to do free cases pro bono. When those cases are assigned to you, you do. that was before the Legal Aid Commission was set up. Now it's the Legal Aid Commission that assigns the cases, but in the past it was the judges. And there's 
Justice Williams who assigned that first case to me. It's interesting because of the name. The name. The basic. The basic. So viewers, you are still talking to Honorable Joe Wise, who is the first deputy speaker of Ghana's parliament. Honorable, thank you very much and you're welcome once again. Um, so let's look at your political journey. And my first question is, what did you do, really do, to catch the eye of former President Kofu? I mean, for him to appoint you as the CEO of DVLA. And I understand you did some quite good work at DVLA. Tell us about that story. Right. I think my political career started as a polling station okay. executive. Actually, at that time, we, we were calling them ward. But I was a chairman of the polling station. Um, I became a chairman of, we call them central ward, like the equivalent of today's electoral area. I became a, an electoral area coordinator in today's terms before I became the chief executive, uh, sorry, the chairman of the constituency. It was during the term of, uh, my term of chairmanship that the party won the elections. In 96, I've been very active. Uh, but in 2000, I became the chairman, and what is very significant was that at that time, connectivity was not this superb. So, as part of our system, we had to mobilize mobile phones to support the election at various places. And I was a member of the Shante Bar. And about 15 lawyers gave me their phones. I took them to my conference, shared to various places we were using to coordinate. I mean, very, today I wonder whether anybody will give you his phone, but even then, <laughs> 15 of my colleague MPs gave me their phones, and then we used it, I shared it to my people after the election, collected it and brought it back to them. But significantly, my conference won. I think we, we didn't win the highest, but about the second highest. Uh, my candidate at the time won 90% of the votes. President Kufo won 90% of the votes at Bekwe. So, um, the then regional chairman, Ever Fanto, before we even won the election, relied on me a lot for writing letters, advising on what is law, and then defending party people who were being prosecuted left and right. Uh, you, you know, that time Professor Mills, the first uh, the candidate of the NDC then. People were hooting at him in Kumasi in particular sometimes. People are mistaken. And then they are sent to court, prosecuted. I did a lot of those cases. Then we won the election. So everyone was very particular. When President Kuvo asked them to propose, uh, no, even the President didn't ask him. He himself, according to him, proposed some active members to be made ministers, and I was on his list. But he tells me when he came, President Gouvo said, no, 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 keep your list in your pocket. Don't bring me any list. I know my own people. Well, however, after the government had been set up, I was doing my practice, law practice, but then Dr. Nani called me and said, listen, Joe, since coming to he was the Minister for Health, since coming here, I've seen that there are not too many people who have as much debt as you have. But I think that you should come to Accra. She came to work with the other ministry. But uh, I wasn't keen on taking on a political appointment unless it was <laughs> Ministerial. ministerial, but what he was, where he was sending me was to work within the Ministry of Health. So I went, he drew up the line for me, you'll be placed here. <laughs> Fortunately, it was close to the bar conference. Okay. And I said, you let me go and come. I said, okay, but I want to set up a committee into an uh, investigation into Ridge Hospital. The uh, nurses did a demonstration to Parliament and I want to investigate that. So he set up a committee into the operations of Ridge Hospital. I was made a chair of the committee. And when we finished that report, when I presented the report to him, I went to the bar conference in Sunya and I never came back to Accra. <laughs> <laughs> so about the 
Six months later, I was driving one afternoon once when I received a call from his special assistant, Colin, and said, Honorable, uh, Minister says that I should tell you that he thinks that DVLA is such a big place. That time he had been moved to transport. It's such a big place, but it's in such a mess. And I think you're the one who can, who can manage the place. So, so I said, sir, okay, you, let, let me think about it. I'll get back. You say, no, 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 no. Your MP says that if you tell you, you will say you're thinking about it, but you won't come back to me. So you have sent your name to the president. I, I learned it was considered as one of the most corrupt institutions then. <laughs> Those are your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> And so he said, we have sent your name to the president. If you won't do it, go and tell him. Hey. Then soon after that, my senior Yabema called. Say, what is this? Why did you work so hard for the party to come to power? You said you wanted to change. But if nobody takes the job, how will the change happen? So, OK, so I took the job. I came to DVLA. Very interesting. I, even though I was originally hesitant, when I took the job, I enjoyed the work. Okay. Uh, from outside, and because before I had read the law, the way I perceived it was different when I took my time to read the law and the functions. Ah, but this is a regulator's job. The job of the DVLA is to regulate road transport, so why shouldn't I? Well, I enjoyed every bit of the work, but generally, I love discipline, I love order. So that's what I strove to do. This is what the law says we should do. We have no power to do anything else. This is what the law says, we, how it should be done. We have no power to do it any other way. And so with those strict regulations, I'm not very firm. If I have evidence that you're doing other way, I'll suck you. So did, did you actually move or increase DVLA's revenue from 1 billion to 76 billion? Yes. Yes. In fact, it's, it started like this. The board chairman, after we had met and before I took over, I went to meet with him and then he said, I think this, ch ch this change is worth it. Then he said, look, I did some small calculations. I picked the number of, uh, number of roadworthiness recorded, time, the fee, the charge the number of registrations recorded, time the fee they charge. And about 40% of the revenue is not accounted for. I asked the chief executive, he's talking about guru boys and things. It doesn't convince me, so I said, okay, I'll try it. So when I took the job, the first thing I did was, okay, at that time, from the DVLA, from chief executive, you go to chief technical officer. There was no practical administration. So I picked two young men. That time there were only two graduates in the organization. Um, Edmund and uh, uh, Semavo, I've yeah, forgotten his first name. Said, okay, the two of you, I'm bringing you up from, they were being used as clerks. Come to my office to assist me. So, all right, so you two graduates, you, this is your assignment. At the close of the day, I want you to take the records. How many vehicles were registered? What were the fees charged? How many road witness tests were done? What were the fees charged? And then you take the revenue posted. Compare activity with revenue. The first day he did it and brought the report to me, <laughs> said 50% oh, of the revenue is not accounted for. So how, how is that possible? You have done the work, it is recorded. You have issued certificates, but the money is not there. So how did the people, meanwhile you're supposed to pay before you do the work. So those who are doing the work must take your receipts before they provide a service. So how come? Then I called their finance people, said, this is what I found. Oh, chief, it cannot be true. It's a Goro boys, I said, no, no. This is not Goro boys matter. This is what is recorded in your own work that you have tested this number of vehicles, you have tested this number of persons for driving license, you have, and so it is not possible for it to be. If Guru Boys did it, it won't come into your record. 
So, so okay, Edmond, you go with them, go and convince them. Within 30 minutes, they came back and said, Chief, what you're saying is true, okay? I don't care, I want my money back. Whoever took the money, wherever, bring it, to go back to government coffers. And the following day, we checked the losses from 50% come to about 25%. By the third day, we're getting excess. Wow. Which should be the case, because there's no everybody who paid for the service who pass. And so you won't get a final product. Okay? Then, two days after, I was in my office one evening when uh, everybody else gone. There was a lady from the controller, like I was sitting there. Yes, oh, Chief, I was coming to see you. Okay, let me attend to these people. After that, she comes in. Uh, oh, Chief, I've heard that you're an Asante. I'm also an Asante. That's why I think I'm coming to greet you, sir. Oh, I see. That's nice to know. That's fine. But if you're part of the stealing that is going on down there, <laughs> please get out of it because when it comes to my work and my reputation, I say, hmm, Chief, that's the reason for which I came home. But the investigation you have started. Uh, will you look back or look forward? So actually there was stealing going on. A lot of them. So I said, well, what happened before I joined, I'm not responsible. But from the time I joined here, I have to account for every Peswa. And so I said, ah, if you look back, then all of us will be affected. Oh. That is when she told me how it is done, how the storekeeper gets of proper genuine receipts from outside what they have been officially given with an, account, uh, an association with the internal auditor and the accounts of the tenant. So for every activity, if they give you one official receipt which is recorded, they give you an extra one for themselves, which is not going into records. It's, it is not from their records. So they do all that. So at the end of the day, what is one for government, one for themselves, one for government, one for themselves. So at the end of the day, our half of the revenue. So, um, and fortunately, at that time I joined, an external auditor, uh, an external auditor was also on site. So soon as I discovered this, he also comes to my office with his interim report and it coincides with what I found. So, ah, these are the things that I've already found. And, uh, that's how come. Wow. Now, let's shift our focus to your work as a parliamentarian. But first and foremost, how did you even get to parliament? Share with us, please. Well, first, I, I came to parliament as an independent member of parliament. I, I was the constituency chairman, then I, appoint, I was appointed the village chief executive. I resigned as, did I resign? No, I just didn't contest the next one. But I was very active in the party in all things. Then in 2007, when they opened nominations, I really wanted to contest. I did everything. But at that time, the sitting MP had also decided to contest. We were close friends, but he didn't discuss anything. Between us, we had discussed that he said we do only two terms. Okay. Frankly, if you had told me, yes, if you had told me I want to do three terms, I would never have contested him. But then what I heard was that he says, "Oh, Joe, he is naive. I am withdrawing from him so I can remove his roots from the party." That really hurt me. But I was so naive. I was just loyal to him. We are friends. I was supporting him. So to think that I am naive, I got hurt. So, okay, let's see who is naive. So I started competing. Competing got to the point that election, as, uh, register was manipulated. People who did not qualify to vote were brought in. So I lost by one vote. I had accepted the results announced. Then when we go home, the community came and said, sir, we don't want that man continue. Whatever it is, we want you to go. Really? <laughs> they invited me to a meeting. I refused to attend the meeting. I sent my immediate past chairman then. When he came back, he and my brother-in-law, I was there when they called said, hey, Joe, I didn't hear you. The way the people are agitated, you have to contest. So, <laughs> for the way. Then I came here. Uh, I 
After the primaries, yes, the, the agitation was loud, and I said it led to violence. Wow. So the party leadership from here went to meet the chiefs at Bekwa. The chiefs won't listen. The community won't listen. They met them with move, go away, we don't want this man. That, that was the end. Then I came, I went to Dr. Anani, and I went to the, uh, Honorable Yabemba, my senior, I said, Mother, the thing that I've started at Bakwai, if you have a way of helping me out, please, otherwise I can't. So Dr. Anani said, okay, you go with me. He arranged a meeting with the chiefs. We went. He said, I should park my car and come in his home. So I drove in his car. When we got to the, to the palace, the chief from various places had come. Then, when he introduced the topic, they took up. Hey, I think they said about the then sitting MP and then, but then he couldn't respond. He couldn't open his mouth again. So I listened to all of them and said, the way it is, he will go back and report to the president. So on our way back, we sat in the vehicle quietly. He didn't say anything. To go to his housing mother, I picked my car and said, Well, Joe, how do we report to the president of the situation? Yes. Then from our president Kufo. President, president Kufo. Kufo. Well, I don't have a choice then. Then they sent me a formal letter. They had formed an association called uh, Amansia Youth Council. Amansia Council, yes. And they sent me a letter that you, it is because of what you have done in the past that we have so much confidence in you we want you to come and lead if you refuse to lead then you may as well stop politics in the district because we will never support you in any move again wow. that was the final word i still have the letter i said so the die is cast i was then dvl chief executive i resigned immediately and, but I didn't announce it. I gave notice and then I built a new head uh, DVLA office. So I said, wait the day of the uh, inauguration of the program, the day we hand over the project, I'll announce it. So the day we came, I announced that I've, I thank President Gufo and Dr. Anani, I've resigned. I'm going to contest. That's how I came to Parliament in 2009. But deep in my heart, I was MPP, even though. <laughs> Officially, I'm independent. And Abdul Jaho used to call me in, uh, independent MPP. But uh, I, was, I did everything with the MPP. I sat with the minority then. I recall Honorable Speaker now. At that time, he was majority leader. He asked me, sir, you say you want to sit with the minority? I said, yes, well, that is not the practice here. Often, when the independents come, they align with the majority. I said, well, I want to align with the minority. So, Honorable, do spare some few minutes to look into your appointment as first Deputy Speaker of Parliament. I want to know, and I believe my viewers would also like to know, were you eyeing a particular ministry before your appointment as the Speaker? I was there when Majority Leader called me. Which ministry were you eyeing? Actually, I had been informed that on, in president, on the president list, you're there, listed Minister for Transport. Oh. Some had called to congratulate me already, so I was just taking my time. <laughs> then, uh, majority leader calls me, said, Joe, we want you to be uh, the British speaker. Say, <laughs> me, Dr. Mr. Why? Either, uh, watch your post now, so but I don't, I don't, I haven't uh, planned on a career in parliament. I want to be part of the executive. Uh, we spoke and spoke and spoke, so, you know. So the following morning, another hackman called me. Whilst I was speaking with the noble Hartman, I was with some of the elders at the choir. Apparently, they were listening in. So as soon as I finished with him, I said, Ah, Joe, deputy speaker, and I'm on our own panel. But I'm for whom I'm a boy, I am fine. It's all because of you. The thing has been given to the choir. If you make us miss it, we won't forgive you. So I said, Listen. I don't want to take a position in which I not be useful to the community. That the real thing is to be able to help the young men get jobs and things. So if I don't have a ministry, I don't say, no, 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 you're not thinking about it well. If you're a speaker, you can, go from, you can get from every ministry. If you're a minister, you'll be only for your ministry, but other ministries, so. 
so for about 45 minutes, everybody was talking. Yes, okay, I give up. So I went back to call the leader. That, okay, I've changed my mind. I was I've uh, uh, you know, been struggling who to replace you. I've made some suggestions, but they said, no, they don't want those. Them. So that's how come I became the first deputy speaker. But, but and frankly, my first term, the seventh parliament, I enjoyed the work. I truly enjoyed the work as a deputy speaker. Okay. Well, probably because of the numbers, numbers. there was order. It was easy to regulate, and we did so much work. I challenge you to investigate how many bills were passed in 2017. Over 100. It has never happened. There was order. There was a lot of negotiations. And I really, it really hurts me that now that we are so close, we can't reach consensus on anything. Even when we had a huge majority, we still would not walk over the minority. We would listen, agree, make changes based on their suggestions and things like that. But this 8th Parliament is, for me, is distressful. Very distressful. But my very last question will be as how you managed to, to pass the president's nomination, I mean the recent ones, but before then, I want to find out, were you disappointed when you later realized that you were not built to become the Minister of Transport then? Well, yes, I was. I was disappointed then. But later, I thought that oh, probably God knew me more than I knew myself, mm -hmm. because I found that truly the speakership is where I belong. In Parliament, you're permitted independence, and that's what I enjoy doing. I'm very independent-minded. I am able to do my work well, effectively here. If I don't decide, if I don't agree with something, I'll tell you, may negotiate and make the changes that are necessary. You know. So, and I'm not the overly partisan person. Often, my focus is on what is the best we can get. You know. So. I, after a few months, I started enjoying this job a lot more than I probably would have enjoyed as a minister. So yes, I was disappointed, but I think my disappointment was misplaced. Misplaced. <laughs> Are you looking at taking up the number three position? What is the number three position? No, I've lost interest in every public service, I must confess. I think that, I said it the other time I repeated, I think people like me are out of fashion in our political system. I'm too old now for them. There are too many young people. I can't, it's difficult for me to deal with the kind of misconduct that happens in the chamber. Very, very difficult for me. The speaker has said that there are too many young men in the chamber. I also agree, but it's not really about the age. When we talk about the young men, it's not about the age, it's about the grooming. Elsewhere, the parties have a system of grooming people, preparing them for the responsibility of being a leader, a democrat. In which democracy are there no disagreements? But disagreement does not mean it should generate into violence, degenerate into abusing the rules. <laughs> One of, I'm very well remembered as a backbencher. Heckling, you don't stand up on your feet. You sit down and make your comments. But here is stand up and even challenging the speaker. Ah, it makes it difficult to keep your cool in those circumstances, right? And unfortunately, <laughs> I think that I'm, I've grown out of fashion and it is time to bow out. I, I, I frankly think that it is time to bow out. Give way to the young people who behave like them. <laughs> 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 really uh, all the others. Are you saying that come 2024, there will be no Joe Wise in Parliament? No, I've already announced that I'm not contesting again. Um, I do not desire to do anything public, like uh, minister or... No, I want a private life. I want to okay. live a quiet life. I think that I've said my due. What my country did for me, supporting my education up to the university level, I think I've put back enough that I've earned my rest. I should give way for other people to come and continue for me. At this stage, my daughter is a lawyer, my son is a lawyer, my niece, all have brought them up. It's time to sit back once a while. Okay. 
join them in discussing that. A lot of the things I do now, if I want legal opinion, I refer to my daughter or my niece to write an opinion for me. Because the rules have changed. So I'm not as current as they are. You know, My personal cases are done by my niece and my daughter. Uh, I, it's time for me to rest. I want to be a, a grandfather now, walking my grandchildren and uh, invest in the things that communities make communities happy. So, Honorable, your final words just before we wrap up on this show? Generally, I don't know whether it's from our education or from our system, the focus on working for government is too much. And that, for me, that orientation should change. But it's not by uh, refusing to approve two or three ministers that will make any difference. The real thing is to encourage young people to work for themselves, to encourage young people to start businesses, to encourage young people to do the things they can do themselves and earn a lot more than public and civil servants. Wow. It's been nice talking to you, Honorable. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So this is where we wrap up on this edition of our personality profile show on Ghana Districts TV. Do join us on subsequent editions. My name is Emmanuel Frimpong. Thanks for watching.